Yeah, hello. Hello. Good morning. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. A little fire burning. A metaphorically fire burning. <laughs> I hope you've had a solution. I have had a solution. Thank you. Do you yeah. have um, let me make you the... Uh, ...in charge. Well, uh, okay. Do you want... Need to upload. Works for you, or, or I do it. I can make you the presenter. I thought I couldn't, but I, I can. Okay. Well, do you want to? Let's see. Um, do I go ahead and upload the PowerPoint? right now. And an audience, maybe they can react to see how our uh, voice is coming across. If it's enough, clear enough. So that, if you could just uh, respond. Hi, this is Bailey. I can hear you just fine. Great. Bailey. Brandon. Hi, this is Meredith. <laughs> this is Brandon. First time I'm talking to him. Okay. So can you see that? I can. It looks wonderful. And me to make you the presenter? Uh, yes, if that will allow me to advance the slides, it might be a little easier. Yeah, I think so. Oh, it says it will end if I'm the presenter. Um, that was the problem last time. Okay, so that means, let's see, um, let's see if I can get my, get there and, and we can you coach me through it. <laughs> 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 So let's see. Um, let me share. I think. Hmm. It's all scary what you might see on the screen. Oh, look at there. there. All right. So let's see if I can head in. Uh, does it all right, yeah. work? Yep, it does. Perfect. So I can see the screen. I wonder why I can't see. All the participants see this as part of it. If you go, if you like mouse up, it'll drop down. You can click on participants. Right. And the chat as well, because that's what we keep us. Like, oh, awesome. Yeah. So let's go 
back. And, um, um, I, want, I want to go back to the first slide. So. That we're set? Yep. Perfect. How how good we are when we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> are you feeling better? Uh, yes, I, I am. Act, I've been vertical now for two days. Oh, good. I hope that. <laughs> yeah. My, yeah, like I said, my husband was on his back for five days. How husbands are when they're sick. <laughs> I, 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 I do. <laughs> and may we all stay healthy. That's the main thing. Yes. Yes. So everybody that's listening, um, it has been well, and your mind is well, and you <laughs> to to uh, disinfect all the all the equipment and the tables and the handles. And I'm pulling a handout too. It was dropped in the Google Drive, so if you all um, haven't seen it yet, go to Module Two, the handout folder. Yeah, you will want that handout because that keeps you from having to write a lot. <laughs> it's not to write anything. That's the main thing. <laughs> No. Do you want me to meet you? I guess until I'll just see them all the background noise to be adding. Yeah. I'll mute guys. Okay. Okay.
How's it going? Good. We're just about to start. We're just like in that awkward waiting phase. <laughs> Sounds good. Then I'll mute you, okay? Okay. We are starting. I want to welcome you all to our first real online WebEx. That's really exciting. Um, you should be excited because we have a, a great person to kick us off. This is Dr. Martha Walker. She's worked with Extension for a while now as our specialist in community viability. Um, and she has lots of experience to share with all of us. Um, she presented last year on this topic. So she's experience in it. I'm going to let her take it away, Martha. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'll make sure you've got a couple things in front of you. First of all, I hope you have the handout that Meredith has posted for you. Uh, it's called Foundations of a Farmer's Market, Governance Policies and Market Rules. If you have that, we'll be using that uh, several times throughout the session this morning. So that's Thing. I hope you see where you can get a response in the check in the chat. So don't make sure you know how to enter that because I'll be asking you questions and asking you to respond. And there's one more thing. We did check sound, but for our new team members who joined us, would you just double check with me and let us know if you can hear? Now probably if your video is on, you want to turn it off. Um, uh, for those, and you just go up to where it says the video option, and you, you just uh, turn the option off. And I think I think that. Well, body, and congratulations! You are a part of the 2018 certification program, and I'm very proud of you guys. Amazing work. The group last year was so much fun, and I got to be with you twice, once a, a back, and then once again in person. So the thought of today is to spend some time talking about governance. And I want to give you a little bit of background. First of all, uh, I have, as Meredith says, I've been with Extension now since 2005 after a very long career with another state agency um, where I was uh, faculty as well as an administrator there. So it's been a, a really wonderful journey, and I have had opportunities to work uh, in a lot of different areas, not only with leadership development, uh, with strategic planning, with decision-making, but also with local food systems, farmers markets, uh, food-based businesses, agritourism, all these areas, and a lot, lot more, including uh, energy on the farm. So it's been an interesting career. Um, and, and a lot of fun with working with all the agents and working with the community partners. So thank you for joining us today. You have this slide title. I have a lot of difficulty not putting the apostrophe with farmers. Um, I think that it, it's multiple farmers who come together to create a market. But as I've been told, look, Martha, how many times do we type the word farmers in farmers? market. Give us a break. And don't make us put the high, uh, the apostrophe. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. I know. Y'all were very adamant about that with me. Like, stop it. <laughs> but, um, you know, I have to sneak it in there every now and then. So, well, today, our job is to really talk about governance. Um, just a little bit of background. Every now and then, I get called into a market and by the local extension office or by district directors or by state leadership. And they say, Martha, our market is struggling get along. along. Our, our board of directors don't be I help us out. And when I come in, I always start with the tools of governance, the bylaws with the Articles of Incorporation, the market rules, and they're asking questions. Where are you on this? Are you funding this? How are you abiding by these rules? And we are finding 
is a discrepancy between what's written and what's practiced. And so this whole idea of transparency, the whole idea of inclusion and communication has been violated. So I want to make sure you all are equipped with the understanding of what these things mean and then how you merge them into your market. So every time I'm going to ask you a question and ask you to kind of post a response. So let's, let's get started and see if this works. So think back to what started your market. I have to wonder, what was the whole idea? And you were part of that beginning experience, and in some of the re work that I've reviewed, sometimes markets get started because people want to buy fresh farm products and they know where to go. Or they want to drive out to the farm. Or farmers don't want them driving out to the farm. And so the farmers come together and they create this little shopping mall. Uh, and they try to make it uh, customer-friendly. Um, they try to bring people in um, who have something to say. Um, and they begin to pull in more customers. And then from there, they build up into these communities. But basically, they start because they want to come together and want to sell their products, in most cases. But there are advantages. It's when farmers come together in one spot, they do so or they pick the spot that is to a downtown area or a hub, a hub of commerce. Or it would be, uh, I find it interesting, not that they'll choose a store that has an open parking lot, they'll choose a park, and they'll come together there. And they'll create this environment. Um, and what happens is increases shopping. <coughs> And when it increases the shopping, more people begin to come together. And that's the ultimate goal. And in the end, it does two things. It aids consumers on local food and along with that nutritional opportunity. It supports the local farming community. And isn't that really what we want? Um, so when you think about why your market is formed, bring people together them good choices, offering them access to good food, and then truly supporting the local economy. And that's what we want. So you have these people together. I need to say one more thing before we leave this whole foundational piece of why people come together. We found that um, when markets also engage other types of vendors, uh, a mixture between agriculture, um, more of the baking or um, uh, bakery variety, as well as uh, an artisan type uh, vendor who might be making a product to sell. That when you create this diversity of uh, vendors, it, it attracts more people to market. Because there's more interest being served, more and more interest. So I'm interested in, in whether or not you have found that true. However, there are markets who are true purists. And they're like, no, Martha, this is all about bringing in local foods, some agricultural produce. And if you be at our market, you got to grow it. It's got to be touching the ground on your farm. So we'll talk about some of those pieces. But a lot of times uh, we've seen where farmers markets actually launch small businesses and the local economic developers will pick up a business from local market and then spin off into like a pop-up store. They'll have these pop-up events in their communities. Um, they'll do uh, high bazaars and everything around vendors. It's kind of interesting how a uh, farmer's market spins off other types of commerce in the community. So just why, why establish a market? Lots of economic opportunity for everyone there. So congratulations.
lessons on your focus that you are supporting economic growth in your region. Always remember that. Let's take a good look at some of the business planning processes that go on and where we are. Um, market's already established. I want to know from you, how long has your market been established? Can enter that in the chat box? And let's see, let's just get a read on how, how long you guys have been in business. <laughs> okay. What a, a brand new market. Wonderful. So we can test this on you. One. That's a fairly new market being represented here today. 20 years, you are an expert. All right. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes, the West End market, Lauren, of course, you all have so much experience um, in, you know, with the market and with the downtown market. Wonderful. So we've got a full array. So we want to contribute. Everyone's knowledge will help build a, a solid base. I'm going to start with you at the beginning. So for those of you that are just starting, this will be yours. For those of you who've been in business a long time, use this information to assess your market. So my idea is born to say, start this market. You ask yourself, is it feasible? What is the true opportunity for success? Um, I was with a group several years ago in the middle part of the state who wanted to start a market. Let me tell you what that looked like. It's a group of people came together, and they were, we've got to have a farmer's market. We need to be able to buy local produce. Our local community needs access. And on and on, and we started talking about it. And I paused the conversation, and I said, all right, so let me find out how many of you actually raised uh, uh, ants or grow produce that you would sell at a market. So this was the number of people sitting in that room on that given day who actually did that, but yet they wanted this market. So where do they have to start? They've got to go find the producers who are willing to come to the market because it is not easy. And I know you will agree to your growing or you're raising items that you're going to sell, and then you've got to come and meet the public. <coughs> what you do not particularly like your product to the market. Get started. The first step is to really do your due diligence. The real feasibility, they're going to be a success. Out there, and I'll take you to that will sell a uh, type of produce or product that the consumer wants. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> I'm getting over the flu. <coughs> and I haven't coughed all morning. Of course, I haven't talked all morning either. <laughs> that, Martha, take your time. I have no rush. This is the second day back at work. <clears throat> <laughs> Feeling great. <laughs> so, excuse me, please. <clears throat> um. Going and thank you for your tolerance. <laughs> Eat the tea, Martha. I hope you relax this afternoon. I'm doing my best, right? <laughs> I want you all to know that I'm practicing very safe, very safe 
Hey, Haji. <laughs> and have been secluded this entire week uh, for over a week now. So disinfecting all kinds of things here. <clears throat> so, so I want to make sure you get this information. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's not contagious over the internet. I'm grateful for that too. Unless <clears throat> we can move forward. We're gonna <coughs> uh, so, all right. Okay. Uh, you think about success I want to think about what are your indicators of success. How much money will it make? How many vendors are you going to need to be in the customers? How many customers do you want to have at the market? What topic are you trying to sell? Because once you identify those things, then you can very quickly measure how you build this market so in your first year. Think about some of your indicators of success for those of you in your 27th year. You want to <coughs> think a little bit about how, how we change to meet market standards. You know, thought that products like steel and hot uh, 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 products would be out there on the market. Uh, I remember growing up that if I had to eat turk salad, I thought that we were having a really terrible day. Um, we uh, hollered. I was in Brunswick County recently, <coughs> and one of the uh, farmers there brought me uh, some hollers. And yet, you do not cook these for hours. These are a 10-minute collard. You drop them into boiling water, and in 10 minutes, they'll be ready. Well, <clears throat> are you kidding me? How can this be possible? It's a not new, but it's a variety that he grows that is so sweet and tender. Oh, my gosh. Are we staying alert? So when you think about your feasibility of you got to think about indicators of success and what are you going to track. And this is not only for the new market, but for existing markets as well. I want you to think about what are your indicators. Then I want you to think about where you're located and something every business entity must assess. Are you in a traffic area? Are you accessible? What's parking like? Is it safe for the traveler? Do you have facilities? Do you have electricity? Do you need in the market? These things go into that location. You know, sometimes um, <clears throat> people put businesses in the strangest places, and you wonder what were they thinking. Um, uh, recently, I was at a location. And, oh, my gosh, when you pulled out onto the highway, you're in jeopardy of being hit every time you pulled out. The road was extremely busy. There were lots of trucks on the road, logging trucks. And you're thinking, why did they choose this spot with absolutely an unsafe egress? It's not exactly what you want. So think about location and assess, and assess your own location now, and, and you do that from a customer service perspective. When people pull on the parking lot, how hard is it to get from their car where they've parked into the market? Is it that? Is it in? Are there thousands of holes and uh, potholes in the in the uh, uh, area, in the walk area? And that's a liability issue too for assessment. So I want you to be thinking about that. So location. Now, the third thing to really kind of look at in a very clear way is control your market. 
is it a wonder to have that side eye? Is it going to be one person? Are they the owner? Is it to be an outside management company? And we're going to talk about all of these things in just a little bit. But I want you to think about who controls and makes the decisions. Because who's going to provide the money to move this market forward? Who pays for the advertising? Who's going to secure the producers? Who's going to hire an employee? Are your volunteers, and who's going to get in touch with the community to invite them and to build relationships with the community there? Think about some of those things that you have to do. Now, if you look at your handout on page um, one, page one, top of page two, when it talks about defining the market type, um, let's 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 take a look at that. <clears throat> Recently, there was a discussion on producers and crafters at the market. <coughs> and should we have crafters? And did it create a more of a retail atmosphere than a true market, farmer's market atmosphere? And some work done by some uh, researchers, they said the best kind of market is a five to one market. Five users to one craft. <coughs> it really defines your community. What does your community want? And water um, probably is not the greatest um, vegetable lover in the world. Well, tell she goes to a market to see the jewelry. She wants to see who's making Jewelry that day. And then we'll say she goes to get, get wreaths for her door uh, because she wants to see those creative souls who are making all of those special things. Well, whatever you decide to do, it's going to be dependent upon your customers and bring customers there because you have a full fledged market of one type. But if it's missing an audience, could you bring it? Now, I say that, but I also have to qualify it. Every market has a set of values that drive the market. And we'll talk that in a little bit. But if your market values production, sales, by agricultural only, then you follow your market values. I talk about jams and baked goods and flowers. Many times, people categorize that group into more of a crafter side because making or doing value-added products. Flowers are cutting the flowers or bringing them in. To me, that's more of a producer side because it's growing from the ground. Um, so, for me, and I'm interested. If you would agree with this, when I think about producers, I think about people who have items that touch the ground, whether it's a crop or it's an animal, they're, they're touching the ground. When I think about uh, those who are adding value added, it's after it's been removed from the ground, it's the fiber that's being turned into something that could be. Uh, the, the fruit and the vegetables that are being created into a value-added product in some other way. Um, baked goods, they're taking the flour and creating a value-added. So I think about that as a value-added side versus a producer. But again, that conversation for your market based value. Good question. All right, so let's take, I've given you four types of markets. Hey, where do you fall? How many of you are producer-only markets? <coughs> producer, okay. Plus that is, okay. Okay, I see that. Okay. 
so what it means to me when I read that is that that motivation. Okay. All right. Um if you're not going to allow someone to come in and sell something that has been produced by other people. Now production um it's where it limits eligibility to farmers who produce their food within a certain region. So that production location means that you are producing, but you also have a geographic boundary. Agriculture artisans no crap. All right, that's it. And uh, the rule is grown within two and a half miles or made by the person selling. That makes sense. That makes sense. And notice how you each are defining what your market will be, but it fits the character and the value of your of your region. That's what you want to do. There's no right answer. You just have to figure it out what what means what what it means to you. Yeah, it means no resale. Um, love cultural elements. Oh gosh, yes. Uh, we have a, a, a friend here in the community to use tobacco uh, tools and tobacco leaves and things and recreate all these amazing products um, and, and uh, sell those. So it's interesting. So it's exciting to know that you've got options, but usually your markets are going to fall within different categories um, or you're going to pick and choose. Um, the biggest piece of this is the origin and transparency. I have found that when farmers decide to clean, that the quick tomatoes that are brought in in a box were grown on the farm creates questions of integrity. And when a farm's integrity is questioned, then all of a sudden the market begins to be disrupted and, um, uh, and questions are being asked and farmers go up in arms and so you have to kind of build that value system. So compared to your farms. All right. So the the third piece here that we want to talk about is how do you actually attract the farmers? Your recruitment is an annual event. <coughs> you don't attract a farmer one year and hope to maintain those farmers year after year. <coughs> so now, just like with, uh, I'm going to give you an example of how we do this with board members because I want to talk about that in a minute. But I want to do this to you with farmers. Grid. And, and I suggest that you outline what types of farm products you're looking for or what types of products, what geographic area you want to cover, that you want representation. Um, Looking for a blend of organic as well as traditional uh, growth practices or production practices, you want to put that on your grid too. And then you create your list of the farms or that you know in contact and see where they match into your preference grid. And this way you can begin to see where your gaps are and can go after and start recruiting those farmers. So the grid system works extremely well for finding out where your gaps are. You also can use uh, surveys of consumers to see where, what kind of products they want at the farmer's market, and then you use that as part of your grid as well. All right, so you've built this out. You've defined your feasibility of success. You've got your indicators in place. You've done, uh, you've uh, done potential locations. You've identified who your audience you're going to be promoting this market to, you've identified your buyers, you've come to consensus on the type of market type you're going to have, you've recruited your farmers, it's time to get together. And you're going to talk about the plan. This is every year. Every year you're going to get together and you're going to say, here's where you are, here's what we're going to do, here's what our season's going to look like, here's our operational hours, and you're going to build this out in to a market strategy and reach agreement that this is what you're going to do. Um, 
take on page two, if you would, before we leave this section. Um, and it talks about ownership of the market. Remember, I talked a little bit about who might own the market. Well, it's uh, it, it dependent upon the environment in which the market was created. How many of you are non profits? A 51C3 or C6? Have you not? Okay, good. Great, all right. If you have a 1C3, it means your emphasis is around education. If you have a C6, it means your emphasis is around promoting a common business interest. You could be more of a cooperative, you could be a whole proprietorship, or you could have created some other type of business entity. The main thing we want to know here is do you know who is your market? Yes. So the YMCA is nonprofit, definitely LLC, so you get it. All right, this is going to define who is the final decision maker and how your board is going to be made up. With time, let's move on and let's pick up and talk a little bit about the board and the organizational structure. But we've foundation, you've got the people there, and you think, oh, Martha, we did that already. Oh, you're doing this every year. This is a review every year of what this looks like. Right. So uh, we've talked a little bit about the voluntary structure. Uh, this is if you're in flow. Some people just say, we're going to together, we're going to have a market. And I want you to know when you start this voluntary structure, struct will not last long. Where someone is going to need a little bit more structure. Someone is going to need a little bit more support. So uh, keep in mind all these different types. And we'll Are any of you run by a management company? There are a couple here in Virginia that come in and help you set up a market and actually run it. Set it, you know, do guidelines, you know, and of course they're they're going to be paid, but but it makes it really easy for you. Um, nobody thought that there are companies who do that. I know that there were some communities who were trying to set up um, a farmer's market, but they didn't really have the expertise, and so they brought in a consultant who had a management company who could work with them. And that worked really all the first year or so until they got their feet under them, and then they moved into a nonprofit status. All right. And what's also interesting is there's a market authority that can set up um, in in Virginia. Uh, I don't know of any community actually did that uh, where the uh, local governing bodies come together and they set up a joint authority that oversees and provides and it's part of the local governance uh, for several communities. So it's kind of interesting. Okay. So let's talk to so you're all together, and, and uh, it's later. sooner or later, you're going to need some kind of guidance, some kind of structure. And the best structure to use are three pieces, bylaws, article of incorporation, and market rules. Let's talk about the difference. And I'm on page three, your handout. Your outlines the rules which the board of directors will operate. That's that's the number one. It has certain components. So we look on page three where it talks about you're going to see the name, the mission. Let's talk the mission. The mission defines the purpose of your market. It very clearly what you're there for. When there is any conflict, I, if you ask me to come and work with you, I'm going to go to that mission. What is your mission? Why are you organized? And then we will see if you are following that mission. The pieces of this, uh, the bylaws, as you know, are going to be the membership of the board and the organization. Uh, you can include in the bylaws if there will be membership fees um, in order 
to be part of the organization if you have to actually have to pay something that in your market rules around vendor participation. It will give you your board uh, number of members as well as the terms, the market right to make rules and provide for the framework, and officer responsibility will be listed there. Who are the officers and what are the responsibilities of each one of those positions? You also begin to um, discuss your times, your conditions, your committee structure, uh, what kind of insurance will you carry, uh, your fiscal year, and how will you amend these bylaws. Also, usually, um, this is a pretty standard document. Many times people will go and borrow someone else's bylaws and they'll adapt it before they adopt it. For their organization, it's very difficult to take one set of bylaws from one person and a, a one organization and just automatically adopt it into your own. You have to do some adapting because there'll be some changes based on your own preferences. I um, also want to include in there what type of organization you are, if you're a nonprofit or if you're any other type of LLC or whatever type of legal entity you are. The corporation go hand in hand with your bylaws. This is the legal position of the organization, and it has to be filed. It has to be kept a copy of it in your files at all times. And usually, it's not revised very often. You might revise bylaws more often, but articles of incorporation are not revised unless it's something. And if so, it is then filed with the State Corporation Commission. So I've given you an outline on page three of all of the things that are in it. Notice the mission and is included in this as well, again, with the members of the board um, and uh, any other details around the organization addresses. And notice in, uh, also it says the registered agent is included. And simply, who's your legal con? Where does the State Corporation Commission send documents, whether it's tax or other types of documents? Um, but I think those of you who are nonprofit have your, your article of incorporation. The LLC has an article, articles of incorporation. The question is, do you know where it is? So if you find it right now, could you go to it? Yeah, <laughs> I see a no, but I see a lot of yeses, so that's good. That's good. All right, so let's move on. Right, you know who to ask all about it. Well, ask. You guys, if you are <coughs> um, organized as a nonprofit, if you're organized as an LLC, if formal organization requires you to have an Articles of Incorporation. So be sure to put your hands on it and have it in your files. Have it there. Third piece, you have got to have market rules. Market rules. Let's just give structure. Some of us can. Do, we want to break all the rules, and that's fine. We'll create. We'll 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 uh, stretch the boundaries. Others need the rules so we can make them better. All together, we're all innovative. We're all creative. The question is where we start with this. But basically, your market rules is providing for fairness and flexibility. Fairness and flexibility. So as you think about these rules, let's look at some of the pieces. Look on page uh, three, bottom of three, top of four. Do you have the market rules? Do you have a set already in place? Good, good. That's okay. great. So the market rules, and these rules will guide everything. When you are recruiting your vendors, they, rule. they know before they spin the door 
here's what we are bad by. And the biggest piece is that they need to be clear and applied in fair and consistent manner. I know, Martha, y'all go, Martha, but it's subjective. It all depends. And that's what attorneys tell us. It all depends. And then they charge us lots of money for that advice. You are trying to make sure that there's transparency in the world. You are trying to make sure that there is fairness and equity in these roles. They protect the market. Now, this it says they work to the advantage of the producers selling at the market, and they maintain high standards of products, customer interaction, and credibility of the market. Your integrity is at stake with these roles. Think about what are the rights and responsibilities of the vendors and what do we follow in making these decisions. In life, if we were together, this is when we really would have a, a strong conversation about what what market role have you found to be most helpful in guiding the interactions of the vendor? So I want you to think about that for just a moment. Of all the rules that you have reviewed with your, for all the rules that you have applied to your market, can you have one rule that help truly guide success of your market. Think for a moment, and if you can think of one, could you post it for us? No one? Well, if you have some of the newer markets, experience it. If you have anything, I want to uh, just offer you a thought. Um, I think that maybe maybe I don't have a rule to tell you that I've seen, but what I have seen that hurts the vendors the most is when there is a lack of communication. Uh, when there's lack of inclusiveness. When vendors feel that they are being... Um, Excluded from a club versus included. Um, hurts the entire market. It hurts the integrity. People begin to question each other, and then uh, you have jealousy that that begins to uh, pop up among the vendors. I'm gonna right here. We've got a uh, says my favorite rule I've seen is a vendor submits a complaint via paper with a twenty-five dollar check and. It gets resolved and gets returned to them. Cut down on vendor complaints about each other that are just petty ones. Oh my gosh, how fun would that be? Boy, you have to have consensus before you implement that one, but I like it. Um, yeah, everyone, share your thoughts because I heard of having when you submit your complaint, you also have to submit the twenty-five dollar uh, kind of a uh, processing fee. Um, other people would say, hey, you're making me pay just to state something that's gone wrong. But if a group agrees to that and they recognize it as a way to go after valid complaints, not just why is this person getting this spot every time, um, that, would, that would be an interesting conversation with the group. So for me, I want you just to be aware that when anyone thinks they're being excluded, when community is shut down, that's the market. Um, scroll back just a minute. It says uh, a petty bite, backbiting among vendors, and that happens. That happens. Um, we just implemented a complaint process like this and created a complaint form based on the porch, uh, Portland Farmers Market. Right, right. Uh, it has helped uh, and hearsay at the market. So look at some of those tools. 
definitely your complaint process needs to formalize. Uh, it's not just a matter of a person walking up and saying, rah, 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 I'm so upset about this. In we have this to go through. We want to hear what you think. Build, build, make sure it's submitted. You will get a response. And also, who's reviewing those complaints? That process has to be clear too. Is an impartial group that's reviewing the complaint, or is member is the most of members of, of uh, those who sell at the market? That's a danger, and then they're seen as being uh, biased. They have dollars. I love that. I love it. Y'all all implemented a fee to hear a complaint. All right, I can. Man, I'm glad my husband hasn't implemented any fees to my complaints because that would be all money. <laughs> um, but I think I like that. All right. So I think clear. There are certain tools that you need for your market. You must have your bylaws. Your purpose must be there along with your process. If you're not following your bylaws, then you're going to end up in integrity with the organization. If formal organization, you will have an Articles of Incorporation. Be sure you know where it is. And finally, most important for your day-to-day -day operation are the market rules. Is it inclusive? Is it helpful? Does it promote the values of the market? All right. So let's move into how, what your organizational structure might look like. And then your board of directors. Directors. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So um, uh, if you go to page four, some of the components of the board of directors and how that's outlined in your bylaws. It also talks about board leadership and where I want to focus around board leadership and what that looks like. Because there's a difference between the leadership and the management. You are management, I think. In other words, you carry out the will of the board. The board sets the vision and the direction of the organization. So let's talk about that and, the, and what the two look like and how they differ. Right. So in your board, bylaws, in your organizational bylaws, it outlines the organization, it outlines the officers and the membership. This would constitute your board. Members who accept a position on the board have three standards that they must follow. And this is based on Sarbanes Oxley, a work that was done in 2005 or compiled in 2005, but done years before, on the obligations and responsibilities of nonprofit organizations. If you haven't seen Surveying's Oxley for Nonprofit Boards, I suggest you get a copy for your board. Or if you see other tools that help your board of directors, at least have one copy available to them because they do have standards that they are asked to follow. I've outlined those for you in your summary on page five, and we'll talk about those in a minute. So in general, about board leadership. The board leadership will give continuity to the organization. It also sets that vision, that long-term vision, based on the values of the organization. Remember I told you it's your values that will drive what you do? All right. If your board is not aligned with the values of the organization, then it's to step back and to clarify what those values are. If you view fresh, high-quality produce, locally, as if whatever your definition of local is. If values, high-quality, value-added products made from things that were produced on land, if it values inclusiveness um, and equity, it values customer service and friendly, if it values safety and, um, and cleanliness and uh, it values uh, co uh, community culture. You see all those reflected within your organization. So think what the 
values are. The other piece that's extremely important for a board is the board is going to set the goals and direction of their organization. So it's going to be to you. This year, we want to make sure that we um, uh, set uh, at least uh, high quality, the high quality price. We introduce new um, options into our, our markets that we are focused on health. What it is, you're going to set those goals and you're going to set those strategies. Also, going to be very alert to conflict of interest. There have been times when members of the board try to manipulate the organization so that the organization benefits them more directly. Um, not, a good, not a good board member, one that needs to exit that board very quickly because you violate a lot. You've got to be alert to conflicts of interest in that. You also want to make sure your policy are fair and equitable, uh, promoting all of that, cover what the organization wants to influence. The board is going to oversee the financial plan to make sure that things are aligned, and they're going to counsel to management. Um, you also, as a board, are going to monitor the promotional activity, uh, and you're going to evaluate what value you're bringing. So when you have all of this that's going on, you're going to see how you recruit, you're going to see how you promote, you're going to make sure you follow all the state and federal local guidelines, um, you're going to get a, a, an environment in the community, and you're going to evaluate. I know you think, oh my gosh, we have to do all of that as a board, you have to make sure it's done. But we tilted into the management side, and we'll talk about that just a little bit more in a second, but I'll get to the standards. So when you think about standards of care, and I've outlined those for you on page five, there are six questions for standards of care, standards of loyalty, and standards of obedience. Standards of care means are we well informed? Will we make Make decisions the right way, voting in the right manner. Are we following our agenda, our outline? That standard of care, standard of loyalty, is the conflict gone? Are we loyal to this organization? Do we apply a code of ethics to our own behavior? And the standards of obedience, are we following our mission? Is it is the relation between our decision making and our financial obligations? Things that the national standards, national, and we all have a duty to follow them. And that means every board member that comes on has to be educated. Which presentation? We just assume people know, and that's every year. So think about your board members. Members, crew, here's what our laws say. Here's what our articles say. Here's what our, uh, our market rules are saying. As a board member, here's what your responsibilities are. And you, can, you cannot just come on and you meet once a year and done. Because they know what the financials are. How are they able to assess performance and to, um, and to report back? Are, and so you've got to track what you're doing. That means take minutes, write it down, and then share those minutes with those stakeholders who are important. So that all of you are finding ways to bring your board of directors together, help them to be organized, help them to understand what their roles and responsibilities are. I know you think they're supposed to know this. They don't. They don't. That's why they need you. You, you are the manager. You are the one who will follow through on this and make sure it happens. So let's go uh, to you as a manager and what that looks like. So this is the little graphic at the bottom where it's leadership and management. So leadership is inspiring the vision, making sure that's moved forward. Management 
is making sure there's operational processes going on and to get making it happen. So I am afraid to even let you look at page six and page seven because you may say, oh, Martha, I made a mistake. I do not want to be the manager of any farmer's market if I have to do all of that. The question to me is, does your job description define your role? Is it clear? And it, especially so often, we have managers who are part time. For just a moment, I just saw this I'm on many boards and was never oriented. Yes, this is true. And I want to shout from the top of my lungs, tell me what you want me to do, and I will do it. But don't tell me who you are as an organization. Help me see what the tools I need to help serve and guide and lead. I can't be a good board member. So I'm urging all of you. Your job is to orient your board member. No, they think that. No. So you work with chair or your president and you sit down and you say, look, Mark Walker said, just like it, it'll be fine. So, and I'm proud to tell you right now that I work with a lot of nonprofit boards. I've been president of a lot of nonprofit organizations. And I have a lot of experience in this. And I know I've used a lot three different times. I, someday I need to quantify that <coughs> and actually put some years to it. <clears throat> Probably say I have about 30 years experience in working with nonprofit boards. And it, and the very first step starts with orientation. And it really impacts, it is by the role of the executive director, the uh, group leader, the group teacher, the, the president, whatever the title is, but the person that wakes up thinking about this every day needs to work with that volunteer who has selected as the board president or the board chair or whatever. Because that person may think they know, but until y'all talk, they don't know. So on page six, I want to talk about management for just a minute. All right, so let me ask about the why. I would hope that the why has given you an advisory board, uh, maybe a subset of the Wired leadership who receives the market because to have a person who you go to or a group you can go to help you with the decision making process. Otherwise, that puts sets you up as the dictator, which means you're going to fail pretty quickly. So think about that and think of how you could influence. Right, start with the CEO. Uh, the why, and then talk to that person about how they want you to make decisions, how you report back. If you're reporting back just to the, the CEO of the why, okay, it's the structure they've given you. Then you might say within your own, I need to set up my own advisory team to help guide the decision making. Let me explain why. Or another, your vendors are going to say we have conflict and we need it resolved, and it's going to have to go. If you are the ultimate authority, that's fine, but do you want some external review? I am a little uncomfortable with only vendors being on a board of directors. I'll just tell you that front. I think it's like the foxes are are guarding the hen house type thing. So I think we need some impartial people from outside who love the market but want to apply an impartial oversight to the market. Think about that. Just think about that. Um, who is it, your board directors, who do you go to as the manager 
to guide the decision making process. If you don't have a board in place, consider establishing an advisory group. Uh, not only maybe a few vendors, but also people who just patron the market, love and have some intelligence about market operations. It may be a good business person you want. It could be a publicity person on that uh, advisory team. I try to equip my board my, with people who have expertise in areas where we're going to need it. Who can Think of you know how you might have created that matrix for vendors and types of products you want to sell at your market? Do the same thing for your board. What kind of expertise are you looking for? Who's, who do you have that could fill that? Are they willing to serve? But make sure that it's very clear. Roles and responsibilities. That's why you have those bylaws. <clears throat> Up here on the management, because I really do want to turn it all over back to you about what tools and, and questions you might have. Your is pretty inclusive and it's all there. You edit this, address it, but basically you're there day to day, every day, following through, carrying out the will and the direction and the goals of the board or your advisory committee or CEO or whoever it is that set your mission. You're there. You have a huge responsibility. No one. No one, you're tired. And so let me just say that for investing in yourself and getting this training. You have to interact between your board, ownership, a lead of direction, and vendor. And you think about the vendors and following those market rules, get people up to speed about what they want and how they want to carry things off, you have to deal with the day operation. What does the tax look like for you? What does insurance look like for you? Opening, mean, closing, um, how do you make sure liability issues are covered? Um, do you deal with organic questions and health department and state and federal licensures and all of those. How many of you actually um, are required by your board to make farm visits? And they actually do have to have a farm visit to every vendor who is going to sell at the market. Uh, part of the market rules. But market operations means day. Oh, so we've got Mary goes uh, farm inspections with the help of the board. Right. That's good. That's good. It's always good to have a partner with you. If it were me, I would always want a team. And sometimes you actually establish um, a team um, where the Williams bring in. They do a visit. Yes. Um, sometimes you can establish subsets of the board who actually subcommittees and other groups who will actually go out and do certain things. And then the other piece of market operations is how do you organize your board to cover the details of your market, um, whether it's recruitment or publicity or um, oversight, visits, um, development of market rules, all those different components. How do you create subsets of your board to help connect so that everyone is not involved in everything, but it functions more as work group specific tasks. Piece that we haven't mentioned that I do want to mention, which is on page eight. Many um, uh, also see themselves as an organ uh, educational service. They'll bring in groups like Mr. Gardner. They'll bring in um, the food nutrition program specialist out of Extension to do food workshops there at the market. They'll bring 
um, health groups to provide uh, services like blood pressure screenings rather than other types of screenings. And they'll, do, they'll provide all kinds of tools to educate the local community. So see this as part of their operation. They also have a plan. And it's in planning that becomes very important. Otherwise, it's almost like trying to capture water. Things are flowing so rapidly. And why now is the time to plan and to think about who you are as a market. You think about this whole foundations of a farmer's market and understanding governance and policy and market rules. Start with why established. What is your purpose? Say in your bylaw, what is it your operational procedures will be? What's your your board going to look like? Who are your officers? Make sure you know about your articles of incorporation. Make sure you've got a hand on those if you're a formal organization. And more importantly, or when more most importantly here, as important are the market rules because that influences the day-to-day operation. Make sure your board is with or to your work. Make sure they know their responsibilities. Make sure they meet. Make sure they track their minutes. Make sure they are transparent. They understand the financial obligations. Make sure they know how to Assess their own market for growth. Look for work as a manager. What are your responsibilities? How do you help guide that, that board? And how do you help carry out the work of that board? Have you organized your board into work groups that focus on specific areas, whether it's the publicity side or the recruitment side or, or the financial pieces or um, valuation, how do you organize that board to make sure your market is strong? And then finally, what do you do about market operations in the reporting so that you know you've covered every detail, whether it's the insurance side or the tax side or, or any of the details that you might need to manage? And if you have an educational component, how do you know that you're carrying that out? Do you have a plan, a task that says on this day we're going to do this, 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 and this, and who's in charge of that? And then you report some kind of indicator of how that went. Well, I've been a fire hydrant and have released all of this information on top of you in a short period of time. but. I Thank you for being part of it. So now it's really, it's your turn. I really want to know what you learned and what questions you have and, and any advice that you have for the group. So this is your time. So if you want um, to question, or I don't, I don't know, Meredith, if we can uh, release them to turn on their mic uh, so they can speak. It's just a few minutes. Maybe we could just chat just a little bit about any lessons you picked up on today, something to know. Oh, look at you. The structure provided is worth millions of dollars. Yes, indeed. I'm with you on that one. Ching, big check. Yeah, people, you can unmute yourself if you want to just talk normally. Um, yes, they go for it. Thank you, Martha. That was awesome. All right. Let's see. Any advice? What, what did you learn today? Questions or should you like to give to others? This is where we learn from each other. Oh, good. You're going to be there, Brandon. That's wonderful. And there's a big, this is an agritourism workshop that we're doing in uh, Smithville on February 13th. Um, I think there are 50 some people who are coming. Tourism is a, a 
great thing about and bring back to your farms be another way to earn some cash. Um, it's intense business planning for sure. Any comments? Good, good. I didn't want to waste your time. I'm sorry. Somebody was getting ready to say something. That was me. I I really think that, that idea of like a subgroup to help you do that is still an idea. You, you know, Meredith. So often we think that we're super super people, and we just can take on all uh, uh, ourselves. Right. Yeah, and we forget that we're stronger when we bring somebody else to the table. Um, and the secret, I think, in bringing people to the table to help build out work groups is to make sure that everyone is clear on what our mission is, what the, and that means what is this group work? What is their purpose? And they're accountable back to the whole board. One leadership developer come in and talk to us at VASMA and he asked, could you each tell me the mission right now? <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, you know, I don't think I could explain to you the mission right now, you know, without looking at it. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that's true for any project that we do. It's true for the organization. And, and, you know, we all have our own personal mission, number one. I mean, when I wake up in the morning, I pretty much remind myself that my goal is to be a contributor into this world today and to leave it better than I found it. That's all. And, um, and in depth to that. But I'm clear on that. I have to find my personal mission. But for uh, for today, for this project, I that my purpose today was to make sure that you need to know this group. I want to make sure you understood what, what the role board is about, the foundation, and what components mean to an organization to keep yourself organized. So uh, this has been a joy. I have loved. Thank you for your tolerance of me this morning. <laughs> no, thank you, Martha. When I did want to talk with the group while they're all here, there is that new box, that legal toolbox. You'll see yeah. it in here for further reading. Um, I put the link there in the Google Drive. I said, Martha, wasn't that amazing, Martha? Yes. Yeah. Um, and thank you, thank you. So, Meredith, last year when we started putting this together, I have to tell you about this, this lady that is working with us here <laughs> sends me a thousand different resources. And fortunately, they're all in your Farmers Market Coalition link. And so I have two notebooks that I read and pulled together to try to compile all of this into something that was at least uh, convinced enough to present. But I want you all to experiment with some of these resources that are out there for you. A brand new tool from the Farmers Market Coalition um, that actually applied. Uh, they talk about liability, which I, is a, a big box in my knowledge. Um, they talk about boards and lead ups and just everything that people ask me that I'm like, uh, I don't want to give you advice that's wrong. You know, it's like all the important things, and they pulled it off in this one tool. So, and for my personal interest, they have a, a whole section on SNAP and SNAP tax issues. Um, so, I'm very excited about it. So, yeah, I think, think it's great. All right. Any questions for me? I'm going to I'm going to my mic and uh, turn it back to Meredith. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, Martha. I know uh, I really appreciate your time. I hope that everyone got something out of that. It's always a pleasure to have Martha present because she's the most <laughs> the most researched and put together presenters for sure. Um, so.
So I am going to remind you of your homework. Let me pull that up while I'm here. So module two and module two assignment and directions folder. So you have a choice this time around of two assignments. Um, one is to identify an issue within your market and current policies around this problem and apply some of the principles learned in, from Martha's lecture to propose a policy change. Um, so that might be to your board or to your, your to your own personal market. So um, that's one option. And then the other option uh, came from Martha's idea it was to interview at least two market managers. I'd have them identify the market rules that have generated the most debate or conflict and the rules that have been widely accepted. And question points for that. So what actions would you propose to reduce the debate or conflict for those markets? And then which rules would you adopt for your own market? So um, just some discussion points for you in, in that assignment. You know, most That's the assignment that we did last year, and people really enjoyed speak to other market managers. So that would be either market managers that you know in your region, um, market managers here in the course with you, um, or I can also put you in touch with market managers. If you're like, Meredith, I don't know anybody else. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so whatever one you choose, remember to upload your response to this assignment in your personal participant folder. That will be uh, incident folder. There's one with your name on it. Um, and you can create one, too. I think I made one for everyone, but I might have a latecomer. So those are the assignments. And remember, that these assignments are due They're due the 19th. So this is time to have you think about it. And then at the Q&A session, a few weeks, you can also talk with us about it there if you have a question about the assignment and you need some help with it. And it's due the following Monday after that uh, Q&A session. Remember, at the Q&A session, I do have experienced market managers call in, so you can also chat with them. Um, and pick their brains as well. So, does anyone have any final questions before we move out? Let me see. Um, okay. okay. I screen. I can share my screen. <laughs> so. Let me back presentation from Martha. Yes, Matthew Gunter. Um, and then share my screen. In trouble sharing from Firefox, so let me pull it up. Um, stop sharing one second and just pull it up in Explorer. Hold on one second. One second, technical difficulties. <laughs> this is all being very slow. Okay. Okay, 
Can you see that better? You can see this now. I'm in modules for Market Manager Second Session 2018. Um, below that is Participant Folder. So if you click on here, you should have your name. Pop it in here. Uh, just title it Module 2. That's fine. And then we can find it. Um, there your assault would go. I'm going to start sharing. Other questions? I saw there were other questions. I do think farm tours are important, and we can talk about that um, at They're important because if you are a producer-only market or if you have rules on um, retail or other things in your market, you want to make sure that what your vendors put on your vendor application at the start of the season that they are going to bring to market um, is actually grown on their farm. Someone's bringing strawberries in August. You know that they might be buying that at, uh, I don't know. Oh, and bringing it to your market and selling it as something that they sold. Um, so yes, people do do farm tours for that reason, for kind of some customer protection, basically. Um, and we talk about them further in the course too. Um. <laughs> Thank you. My laugh will definitely on you for sure. <laughs> um, okay. So, are there any other questions? Sorry, technical difficulties I just had. Um, I'll have a fabulous weekend. Congratulations on making it through our first mo real module online. And I look forward to seeing your assignment. You have. You have days to get it together, so don't worry about it. Um, if home assignments freak you out, you can always call me. Trust me, I, I just want it to be something that's useful to you. So, yeah, thank you, Martha. We really appreciate you slogging it out with us, and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I'm going to end the meeting now unless someone has a last question. Nope. Okay. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Martha. And I will see you in a week. Thanks. <laughs> Have a great weekend.